Hello and welcome back to series two of the Love History Podcast. So great to have you here with us again. If you haven't listened to series one, do go back and give it a listen. But we have some fantastic, fantastic people to chat to over the next couple of weeks. I'm Mock. I'm an LGBTQ plus historian. I live in a baby castle in Wales and I am the co-host of the Love History Podcast. But my co-host has changed this time. I haven't fallen out of love with old Barbara Tens, but she's busy writing a book. So I am delighted to welcome a new co-host, Louisa, who joins me here. Louisa, contestant number one. What's your name? Where do you come from? And tell us a bit about yourself. Oh, hi, Mark. Thank you so much for inviting me to do this with you. I'm just full of questions for everybody. I can't wait to meet all our, all our different guests. But me, uh, I run under Louisa Scott Sewing, which you can find me on uh, um, Instagram or Facebook. And I like to make uh, historical dresses. I've been doing it for a few years now, making dresses for myself. But I used to make dresses long, long time ago for the opera. Um, and so my, my background is, is theatrical and uh, historical. And I just love anything old, uh, whether it be furniture, buildings, but a particularly fashion, yeah. So that's, I love all that kind of stuff. And one of the questions we always ask, and it's probably going to have a, a costume or a clothing bent for you, is we always say, what have you been up to historically this week? So I'll ask you and then you can ask me. So Louisa, what have you, historically speaking, been up to this week? What have I been up to this week? Well, I've just literally today started to make the toile for a panto costume and the theme is around 1890 so I'm looking at this enormous skirt on my stand and these huge sleeves <laughs> so that's what I'm working on and uh yeah I will I can't wait to show you what it's all going to look like when it's finished it'll just be very mad what about you Mock what have you been doing uh, so historically speaking I live in history at the little baby castle in Wales and um when we moved in, we renovated the turret and I chose this lovely heritage colour paint, put it on, but um, it blistered and it burst because it wasn't the right type of paint. I've been learning that I needed a special lime type of paint that needed the walls to breathe. So I had to scrape all the paint off. We had to replaster with lime based plaster, which has been drying out over the summer, a rather wet summer. and. Uh, the last couple of days, uh, we have been repainting the turret with a beautiful lime-based dog rose colour. Um, so historically speaking, I've been renovating my turret. And turrets actually, and towers, have a relevance to this week's guest, because this week we are talking to Hannah Squire, who is collections and house manager at Sissinghurst Castle, which was the home of Vita Sackville-West. Sissinghurst now very well known as a beautiful garden, an Elizabethan tower where Vita wrote her books. Uh, in her lifetime, she was a very famous novelist and, and Hannah tells us a little bit more about Vita, about the gardens, and also interestingly about um, gaps in history and why it's so important to reinterpret history. So shall we have a listen to the interview and then come back and say what we learned? Brilliant, can't wait. Super, let's hand over to Hannah. See you in a bit. So welcome, Hannah, to the Love History <laughs> podcast, all the way from Sissinghurst Castle, which is rather amazing to have you with us today. Thank you so much for joining us. Hi, Hannah. Oh, no, thank you so much for having me. Hello. Hi, Louisa. Thank you both. We're really excited to chat to you. Um, now, you are the collections manager at Sissinghurst Castle. So the first thing I have to ask you, and I know you're not speaking for the National Trust, you're speaking for yourself as a person, but what... What does a collections manager mean? What do you do? What is a collections manager? I've seen the job title. What is it? <laughs> so, yeah, it's called collections and house manager. Um, and I, I actually work across four different sites. So I'm a collections and house manager for four places. Um, uh, Sissinghurst is one of those. It's where I spend the majority of my time. But what that means in the National Trust is that I really kind of have oversight 
and we oversee both um, our conservation care, care of our collections, whether that's the day to day cleaning, whether that's bigger remedial conservation projects where things need to go away to be conserved. And um, I also look at that research development of how our collections are on our database, the information we have about them, how we develop that. So we have a greater knowledge of what we have and then also how then we can interpret that to visitors that come. So how we can we can create really enticing, interesting, relevant, resonant stories for people when they come and visit and want to keep repeat visiting Sissinghurst. So new objects, new stories. Um, also, I'm looking at working with various artists to kind of see contemporary responses to our pieces. So yeah, it's sort of a nutshell effectively, but I just kind of look after our, our team um, of collection staff and sort of oversee everything to do with our collection. Which is funny because I do have people both in the trust and outside the trust who will say to me, oh, there's actually a collection at Sissinghurst because we are so known as a garden, you know, we are so incredibly well known for that, that it's really um, kind of trying to uh, make people aware of that we have the, well, we think it's the third largest book collection in the National Trust. It, wow. So it's the most significant collection. So That's amazing. It sounds like you're in charge of everything. <laughs> <laughs> no, just the interior things. Don't ask me about plants. I'm learning very much from the garden team who are incredible. But um, yeah, no, I'm just focused on all our interior incredible collections. So. And what other properties? Is it is it Monk's House, Small High? Tell me what the other properties are that you are collections and house manager for as well. I don't look after Monk's House. I would love to, trust me. I think um, Virginia Woolf's home are absolutely incredible. So no, it's more kind of generally... Um, you oversee uh, it's the other properties that are in the vicinity effectively so it's also Small Hive Place so Ellen Terry's home mm -hmm. uh, where they do have an incredible portrait of Vita within their collection so yeah Ellen Terry the great Victorian actress and her daughter Edie Craig um, who was a really wonderful writer. I believe her daughter was a queer icon as well Oh, definitely. Yes. With her and Christopher St. John and Tony Atwood, there's an incredible collection of Claire Tony Atwood's art there that I really would love to do more with um, if we can. So, yeah, definitely. There's that incredible relationship there. And then we also have Lamb House, which more queer relation, more queer identities there. And we think of um, E.F. Benson, who wrote Map and Lucia, who lived there. Henry James, the American English writer who lived there. And then later, Rue McGodden lived there in the 70s, another writer. So that's sort of another house of writers. And then the fourth place I look after, which is open a lot less, but is still a really beautiful hidden gem, is called Stoneacre. So it's in a very little village called Ottom near Maidstone, really idyllic, really beautiful. Um, it was Emma Valance who wrote a biography of William Morris and he was fascinated by arts and crafts, lived there and very much involved early on in the trust and wanted to give that place as an example of this kind of old Kent Hall house to the trust. So yeah, I look after those four. I bet you spend your time going as CO2 affordable as possible between all those properties to be. But how do you get to be? If someone's listening to this now and says, oh, I like the sound of that. Maybe I'm thinking about what university courses to, to do, or maybe I'm thinking about having a career change. How would someone go about saying, I want a career as a collections and house manager within the National Trust or within any historic house? Mm. Oh yeah, just to say about the, the driving, they are close to each other, they're supposed to be, and I spend most of my time at Sissinghurst, so, but yeah, I do get to, I do have the luxury of being able to travel between all four. Um, with me, so I, um, I actually grew up next to a National Trust place. I was very lucky from a small, from a young child. I grew up next to a place called Whittock Manor in Wolverhampton, which is still one of my loves of, in the Trust. So as a kid, I used to run around their gardens. You know, we were there all the time. They, it was a really big, it was sort of the local park really that we had. And I loved, I fell in love with the art collection there as well. So I grew up next to it. I was kind of, I think it's why I'm so passionate about having, um, school groups and kids visit our places because I think sometimes the trust can feel um, well it has in the past we're doing a lot towards it not feeling like this very kind of middle class very kind of almost like if you don't know very much about history or art that um, you could feel intimidated by I think that's generally across the heritage museum sector so really to kind of ensure that people feel that it's for them and um, so I started off there as a volunteer and um, so I went to study well I went to the English at Birmingham Quickly switched to art history because at Birmingham there's the amazing Barber Art Gallery, this beautiful Art Deco building with the most incredible small collection of art there. So I studied there, and then when I while I was studying at the weekend, um, I started volunteering at Whittock as just a room guide. I was really shy, so it was a great way to kind of learn how to talk to people, learn when people don't want to talk to you when they do. 
became fascinated by the collections and really thought, well, this is actually somewhere I'd like to spend most of my time. Um, so I did some more volunteering there in the conservation side of it um, for a few years while I was get, doing my undergraduate and my master's. And then um, when I was fortuitously leaving my master's, a job as a what was at the time called a conservation assistant came up there. And I started doing that role. And then ever since, well, I've worked for local museums as well, but um, I've kind of come back to the trust quite often. So it's definitely, there's there's an academic route, but also there seems like there's a real passion. It's a passion job because you live on site, don't you? I mean, that, and you must presumably live wherever the job takes you. So you could, I've met people who work for the trust who live on remote islands and all sorts of places. So you could live anywhere for work. Yeah, so it comes with um, it's it's certain kind of job roles that it tends to come with. So yeah, I before here I lived at a place called Colton Fishacre in Devon, in South Devon. Really beautiful, um, amazing uh, amazing views of the sea there. So I lived there before I came here. So yeah, you get to live on site. So it means that I'm both, you know, I have these hundreds of acres I can walk my dog Agatha around, um, and go into the garden here at Sissinghurst after hours. Um, so yeah, I do that. It also means you kind of live at work um, and you cover yeah certain security things. But it is yeah, it means that yeah, you go kind of where the job where you get to live where your job is. So it's yeah, it's really useful. I really appreciate it. You can't you can't get a takeaway then, can you? Oh, don't. Because how do they deliver a takeaway to a castle? <laughs> no. So my sister lives in London, and I just the luxury of her with the apps and everything that she can order. No, you used to be able to. There used to be a Indian uh, restaurant in the village. And apparently they used to deliver here, but that is no longer there. So no, I have to sort of venture out. I'm not the best cook, so I do. There are some nice local pubs, but yeah, venture out to find food. And I have not yet found, coming from the Midlands, growing up in Wolverhampton and having access as well to Birmingham and the incredible, I mean, there's Michelin star Indian restaurants, the most incredible food. It is very, it's hard to find in rural Kent. And I am new, so maybe I've just not discovered the right places to eat. But yeah, I tend to, um, it's nice to live not too far from London. I can go in and um, yeah, find some more of my kind of favourite kind of food. So yeah. Uh, I was just going to say that uh, I used to live at Edinburgh Castle and the one thing that oh, we couldn't wow. get was a takeaway. Mm. So at least, Mark, you can get a takeaway to your castle. <laughs> <laughs> you haven't got delivery or anything like that around here. There are places that do deliver, but I tend to eat very healthily, eat vegan, gluten-free, tomato-free. So actually takeaways and deliveries are probably not my thing. Um, so, but I, you know, I, I don't mind. I, I'll, I'll, I'll give that up for living in a castle. But tell us a little bit more about Sissinghurst Castle, because I know you've got a particular passion uh, for Sissinghurst. Tell us, if people don't know, she's an icon for me, Vita and her husband. Tell us a little bit about Vita, who lives there, and why you are so passionate about that particular property. Yeah, so Vita Sackville West is kind of, uh, we did actually, uh, in a previous role that I was in, we once had like um, an ice breaking session where it was like, if you could snog anybody from history, who would you snog? And um, I was able to have two picks being by, and one of my picks was Vita Sackville West. Who was the other? So um, I kind of, uh, who was the other? I'm trying to remember now. It could be between a couple. It was either John Keats, because I've just been obsessed with his poetry, or it might have been Oscar Wilde. And to be honest, Oscar Wilde and Vita, when you look at them in their hats and their outfits, they don't look too dissimilar to me. There's definitely some kind of ties there. And so Vita Sackville West, she's now very well known, well, renowned, um, world renowned for her garden, but um, she was a fiction writer and she was... Um, I think she was just incredibly bold in who she was, which I really love about her. We know she had over 50 female lovers throughout her life. Um, her poetry is fascinating. And I came to know of her through Virginia Woolf. So I studied Virginia Woolf a bit at school. I became obsessed with A Room of One's Own um, in my kind of budding days as a feminist. And then I read Orlando, which is still my favourite work by Virginia Woolf, and came across this figure, who is Orlando? Who is this incredible Elizabethan... Um, aristocrat who travels throughout time and changes their gender um, and it's this love letter and then I discovered it was a love letter by Virginia Woolf to I think one of her soulmates Vita Sackville West and there is a lovely photograph of both Virginia Woolf and Harold Nickerson on Vita's writing desk here 
Um, and this place really speaks to Vita as Orlando, I think, because it's uh, an Elizabethan ruin, effectively. So when Vita came to look at Sissinghurst in 1930 with her lover at the time, Dorothy Wellesley, Dotty, um, they came to see it and she fell in love with the place. So it was marketed as a Victorian farmhouse with ruins. And Vita wasn't particularly interested in the Victorian farmhouse, which would have been much more comfortable for a family, but had no interest because you've got this incredible tower and these incredible buildings within this, um, the place where Queen Elizabeth visited as well, the first, this uh, incredible Elizabethan ruin, which she then later discovered her family had actually lived here. Um, which she didn't know at the time. But yeah, so she then found that family connection and she was really looking for somewhere. So Vita should have inherited, in my opinion, well, should have inherited Knoll Park, which is also in Kent, but Seven Oaks. So she grew up in this palace. It's called a calendar house. We're not quite sure if there are 364, 365 rooms there, but it's a palace that she was the only child Vita grew up in. Um, and because she was a girl, couldn't inherit and have to leave. But um, and then she married in 1913, a man called Harold Nicholson. And I think Vita was also able to be who she was and have her relationships and have her um, her freedom because she married Harold Nicholson, um, who was a diplomat. He became then became a politician, a writer. He actually stopped being a diplomat because Vita didn't want to be a diplomat's wife, you know, traveling around the world so much. They'd spent time in um, what was then known as Persia. And we had a fabulous exhibition here of the things they brought back with them. But um, he really, he was himself had same sex relationships with lots of different men and he had a flat in London. And um, so Vita spent most of her time here uh, and then would travel to and from. Harold was in London in the week and then would come at the weekend. So they had this really kind of, I think, respectful uh, marriage where they both had their their passions, their romances, but were really committed and dedicated to each other and to their two boys. So, yeah, Harold is somebody I think he has been overlooked, um, but somebody would like to draw out more. I think like lots of married people, they came to some sort of arrangement about how their, their marriage worked. Now, I love Vita. She's an icon for me. Not only is she a queer icon, I also live in an Elizabethan castle. I have a tower. I built a white garden in honour mm. of her. But the mm. more... I read about her, and we've talked a little bit about this, haven't we, Hannah? The more I think there's quite a hard and a harsh mm. side to Vita in terms of she did, you know, she she ran after Virginia and really pursued her and then kind of slightly tossed mm. her aside. And she did, I think, because of her privilege and her financial stability and her aristocratic roots, she did kind of go through people a little bit, didn't mm. she? Yes, well, having over 50 lovers, I mean, I don't know how you keep up. I mean, to me, that just seems like the energy Ow! required Ow! is just incredible. Um, so, yeah, I <laughs> I know, I think there was, I think, um, I mean, even the way Virginia kind of talks about her in letters, and I think sometimes there's very much a focus on it being a cerebral relationship, but there was, there's a real eroticism of physicality in their letters about how she sees Vita. And I think she's an incredibly intoxicating person. I'm always, I don't want to ever create uh, Sissing Hers mm. as a shrine, you know, and to only focus on um, the amazing aspects of it, but to really to see her as a balanced human being, which is what we all are, to not make somebody into a, a saint or a sinner. Um, so yeah, she did. Um, I think there's also her relationship with her sons was quite difficult. I mean, they've both spoken about that distance. I mean, I'm always hesitant because I think we focus on that a lot with women about how good they were as mothers and we don't tend to do that with men. Nobody talks about how Picasso was mm. as a father. But um, yeah, they were definite, you know, I think she was when she loved you, it was um, passionate and intoxicated, incredibly close. You see this from her various love letters as well and from her writings that, you know, the challenge that's dedicated to Violet. But yeah, I think there was also that side of her that was quite voracious, which was kind of moving on to other people and um, yes, and she could be quite cutting, you know, I'm, sh you know, she, I'm sure, well, she was a snob as well, you know, from that background that she came from, and that time period that she grew up in as well you know, and that sense of also the society that she lived in as well. So we have to also take her as part of her context. I do sometimes wonder what she'd think of me being here. <laughs> One of her lovers um, was from the black country like I am um, at Long Barn, but I do sometimes wonder what she'd think of me. Regardless of if she liked me or not, I like her, so it's fine. I think, I you, I think when you live in a historic property, I know that that one of the previous owners is buried out in the garden and I kind of say hello to her every morning and I, I wander through these rooms and I think what will she mm. make of my husband and I and our two dogs as I scatter off to do a podcast. I think she's looking thinking, what are you doing? But we have to, you know, 
honor them, but also represent them in their context. Now, talking of context, there's lots, there's been lots of conversation in how history is presented, you know, accusations of it being, you know, taken over by a woke agenda, uh, you know, that decolonizing, um, you know, the or talking more about empire, uh, you know, assisting her to write an open queer story, but other places, not necessarily just trust, let's talk about just generally hist how history is presented. Um, it can be open to accusations of being woke and actually to some extent, the conversations that lots of curators are having now around the artifacts, they, they are being accused of diminishing our unique history as a nation. I don't believe that's true. I think we're understanding more about the complexity of our nation, how we've impacted the world. But what is your what are your personal thoughts around accusations of, uh, you know, that we're being too woke or we're talking about things that no one's really interested in? Who cares where they put their willy? <laughs> I think that's a very privileged position to come from. And it's usually from people whose history has always been told that they can't see where the gaps are. Um, and before uh, before we had um, COVID and lockdown and the reset in the trust, so I was part of, we were called the National Public Programming Team, so looking at inclusive histories, so um, my former boss, the wonderful Rachel Len Lennon, led on Prejudice and Pride in 2017, which was really looking at um, that national, uh, telling LGBTQ stories, 2018 Women in Power, and then 2019 as well, People's Landscapes, that was looking at uh, access to um uh green areas so it's based on the mm. it was the anniversary of the peterloo massacre um, and kind of looking at as well when it's passed and how we have access to our landscape so no i think um i also don't think they're aware of what the term woke actually means and then it comes from the united states and it comes from the african-american population that about being awakened to um uh, systematic prejudice, uh, violence, you know, that's where the, so I'm very happy to be called woke because um, of actually what it means. Me too. Yeah, and I think, no, and I think the National Trust is, I mean, our slogan is um, forever, uh, it's, they change it the way around, so I'm trying to remember which way around it is, it's forever for everyone. Um, no, I think it's for everyone forever now, anyway, one or the other. Um, so yeah, no, it is about, it's kind of wanting people to be represented at our places. And I remember a few years ago when Sarah Waters, who's one of my favourite writers, who writes incredible kind of lesbian historical fiction, she talked about coming to Sissinghurst for the first time with her partner and just feeling uh, really at home. So no, I think it's about, it's where, it's the gaps are, where we haven't told stories, where we don't, um, when we look at our collections and when we have a lot of knowledge, for example, potentially about some of our European collections, but then we look at some of our um, Asian or African collections and there's historically just been less knowledge there. So about expanding. So it's not about telling less histories, it's about telling more. And what I find bringing it back to Vita actually is uh, historically as well, we've often told um, we've spoken about people, uh, usually women in comparison to their fathers or husbands. So this is the daughter of this is the wife of and their lady, you know, you could call Vita Lady Nicholson if you wanted to. Um, but she very much when it comes to her writing and her um, identity is Vita Sackville West. She does in some of her early books at Long Barn, where she lived before Sissinghurst, she writes herself as VN. Um, and on her passport that we have here, she is Vita Nicholson, but she is very much Vita Sackville West. So no, for me, it's just actually really exciting to be the focus to be on telling more stories, not less. Cool. Great. Thank you. So moving away from Vita to the pre-Raphaelites, which I know is something that you love. You were recently teaching on a VNA online course that I was a member of about kind of a queer history of art. And you're very involved in the pre-Raphaelite society. Tell us a little bit about the society and your involvement in it? Yeah, so that all started at Whittock. So um, I kind of just grew up around all these incredible red-headed, uh, Titian-haired, incredibly strong-looking women in the collection there, Pre-Raphaelite Art. And if people don't know, Pre-Raphaelite Art is, uh, I think, one of the most interesting kind of British art movements we've ever had. So it began in the mid-19th century, um, initially with, uh, it's called the Pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood, so a group of really young, kind of 19, 20, 21 young men um, and women of the wider circle were looking at completely changing, revolutionising the art world and how we how we drew and how we represented uh, real life at the time, contemporary life that they felt wasn't happening. 
Um, and so I grew up there and I started when I was an assistant there researching into the art. We hadn't just discovered that at Wittick, they had the work of 13 professional women artists, many of the Paraphylite era, but also uh, more generally the Victorian era. They had over 30 works by women that had actively been, a lot of them actively collected by the Manders who had lived there who are themselves very supportive of women's rights. And that's more works than the, the, that are in the National Gallery. So the National Gallery in London, I believe has 20, unless they've acquired more recently, um, they have 22 artworks by women in their collection. Wittick, this smaller, you know, small but incredibly formed um, museum in Wolverhampton has over 30. So that's where it began. And I started researching Paraphylite art generally because being in Wolverhampton and Birmingham, these industrial centres where this art was collected, there's so much of it. Um, and then, yeah, did an exhibition about Elizabeth Siddle at Wittick, did another one there, co-curated about Evelyn de Morgan, discovered the Paraphylite Society um, just in my general research and joined them and I would get the kind of regular magazine and then really wanted to become more and more involved so that's when I um got involved with the podcast so I'm one of the kind of podcast co-hosts of the Paraphylite Society I look after their social media because I'm quite addicted to social media so I thought let's also use this for something that's a bit you know uh more helpful in spreading the word about Paraphylite art um, and Instagram particularly such a visual medium I've you know had conversations with people from all over the world who've discovered this work so and I just think it was a really radical interesting movement there's some incredible women who were part of that um collected of the Paraphylite, which was lovely to see that now you see us exhibition at Tate Britain that featured some incredible Paraphylite art. So yeah, it kind of uh, it all came from that. And the society has just been, it's such a lovely group of people, so supportive, I, you know, all their lectures and the conversations there. So yeah, I really enjoy working with them. And if people want to find the social media handle for the Pre-Raphaelite Society, where should they go? Mm. So um, we are active on Facebook, X and Instagram. Just search Pre-Raphaelite Society and we will be the first one that comes up. We also have on Facebook and X, I keep wanting to say Twitter, we have, um, you can also follow the podcast there as well. We don't have a separate podcast Instagram account, but you can find us there. And then you can listen to us anywhere you listen to podcasts, just type in Pre-Raphaelite podcast and we will come up so I try and do some sort of extra posts on Instagram so if you want to pick one and um, we tend to do a bit more on there but um yeah we are across all and we do have our own website as well if you want to check that out I will make sure it goes in the show notes now our time with you is nearly at an end I've got a, a quick fire yeah go I'll for ask it. you about an exhibition that's coming up and make sure everyone's got for you so quick fire round Ita or Virginia oh god <laughs> In terms of their person or in terms of their work? Sorry, I can't do quick fire on that question. Vita or Virginia? Who would you like to have in the room with you? Oh, Vita. <laughs> Sissinghurst Castle or Charleston Farmhouse? Oh, God. Uh, Sissinghurst. Not just because I work here, but Sissinghurst. Scone or scone? Scone. I just, I, I never say the word scone ever. Scone just sounds posh to me. No, scone. Oh. Louisa, scone or scone? Definitely scone. <laughs> oh. <laughs> and with raisins in. Okay, then Georgian or Victorian? Victorian. Rossetti or Morris? Rossetti, always. <laughs> London or the countryside? Uh, it's a difficult one. Countryside. Dog or cat? Dog. Agatha's sitting in the room listening. I have to say dog. <laughs> Art or literature? Oh God, I've studied both. Um, art, art. Although you've chosen art, talking of literature, you have an exhibition next year between the covers at Sissinghurst. So tell us a little bit about it and when it is so that our lovely listeners and viewers can pop along to Sissinghurst in Castle and visit it. Yes, it's called Between the Covers with Vita. We are working with an artist in residence called Sarah Tannett Jones, who you might know from her work for The Guardian and the publication's really bright, bold artworks. And it is looking at uh, Vita Sackville West's fiction and poetry. I'm conscious that she wanted to be known as a great writer and she was a best selling author in her lifetime. But I think she's in the shadow because Virginia Woolf is such a genius. You're kind of always going to be measured by 
uh, lesser by comparison. But yeah, so we're looking at um, some of her fiction. So I'm not sure how many people are aware that she wrote A Murder Mystery, The De Devil at Westies. She wrote Science Fiction, The Grand Canyon. And um, she wrote Love Stories. She wrote stories about inheritance, about family issues. So yeah, we're looking at 10 of her um, novels and poetry. Uh, Sarah artwork is being inspired by those and then I'm working with other staff and volunteers in our community who are each reading one of them and is going to have their kind of their contemporary response as well to what they think of these poems and these novels and also how it relates to their lives and also how you know what they learn from Vita about it uh, so yeah and I feel like there should there's never been an exhibition done about her books and um yeah she wants to be known as a great writer so let's kind of celebrate her as a writer and when is that so it's opening the 1st of February and um, there's going to be a series of programming throughout the year and it should run for about a year at Sissinghurst. Wow. I mean, I find it amazing that there hasn't been an exhibition on her novels. As you say, we know her because of the tower. We know her because of her, her relationship. We know her because of gardens. But she would have been described herself probably as a novelist. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, um, one of the novels we look at, All Passion Spent, was such a bestseller, along with the Edwardians, you know, she was really well known for them. They're really, really well written. I really enjoy them as works of literature. Like, I think, um, I'm hoping there'll be a kind of, a, you can still buy some of her books in print, but I'm hoping there'll be a resurgence. And we started a book club here as well, for staff and volunteers, to just kind of get people reading her work, because I think it's great. So yeah, hopefully, it should be good. Super. Now, talking of reading and getting and getting famous, if people want to connect with <laughs> you, Hannah, after today, and I'm sure they will, mm. uh, wh where is the best place to get you? I I found you on Instagram. What what's the best place to get you on Instagram? What's your Instagram handle? So I have like a more sort of personal, just Hannah Osquire one, which it shows a bit about what I'm doing at work and just me personally. Um, but that's just a bit more sort of overarching. But um, Squire Shelf is my Bookstagram account, just where I really focus on the books I'm reading. Um, yes, because I really just there's a really fabulous community, I think, online of writers and readers. And I want to be a part of it and have a specific page dedicated to it. So. Yes, my, I'm on Instagram all the time. You can always find me there. Either doing the Paraphylite Society, stuff for Sissing Her, stuff for me, or for books. So, yeah. Well, I'll make sure that all of it goes in the show notes. If everyone wants to check those out today as well, they can have a look, have a click. We'll put a link through to the Pre-Raphaelite Society as well. Mm -hmm. So, Hannah, it's been great to chat to you this afternoon, hasn't it, Louisa? Mm -hmm. I've had a great time. Oh, amazing. Just full of knowledge. Absolutely fantastic. I'm sorry if I've rabbited on too much. I get so excited and then I have long answers. No, it was great. We've had an absolutely fantastic time. I'm sure people will love hearing what you've got to say. But for now, before we come and visit you at Sissinghurst next year to see the exhibition, Louisa will be coming along in historical costume. And my, I might tip this rate as well. Please do. Please do. Well, actually, I had a, I had a, I had a question about that. Would uh, Sissinghurst ever do uh, an all immersive uh, weekend experience? Oh. So people who are part of costume societies, whether they could come all dressed in the appropriate mm. decade uh, and have an all immersive experience and sit in the library and, and have dinner or anything like that, would, would uh, Sissinghurst ever consider that? I'd love that idea. We had um, Holly recently, who's a drag king, who's Orlando, who came dressed up and gave a talk here for us and was incredible. And it was so wonderful to have. Um, she's dressed Orlando, so it's more sort of... Uh, actually, no, she did also dress as Vita. No, that would be absolutely wonderful, Louisa. I would love to. I kind of love both the Bloom Street and the Bright Young Things. I think this year is fascinating for fashion. Um, and yeah, I'd love to. Mm -hmm. um, we'd have to talk with our programming team, but I think, Louisa, that would be absolutely fantastic. Okay. I think it would be lovely. Maybe we could we could organise something with uh, one of the costume groups I'm mm -hmm. a member of who very much dress in this era. They, I'm sure they would love Amazing. it. Amazing. I would love that, Louise. That would be fabulous. And we can film it and we can do a podcast from there. Super. Mm -hmm. But for now, yep. Hannah, thank you so much for your time. Mm -hmm. We'll get back to your dog and your castle and your books. Take care. And thanks for being <laughs> part of the Love History Podcast. Take care. Bye, Hannah. Thank you so much. Thank you both. Wow, so that that was Hannah at Sissinghurst. That was fascinating. Wasn't she was it? lovely, wasn't she? Just so much to say. I could listen to her all day. Absolutely. I mean, I think that level 
of passion. It comes across in in some of the houses when you go and visit them. You know, obviously, we don't know who's behind the scenes, but you can you can feel it, you can taste it, you can touch it. And I haven't been to Sissonhurst yet, although I absolutely should and must. We should go together. Yeah, we should go together, definitely. But I think her passion and her enthusiasm will be tangible when we come there. Now, we always ask the question at the end of each episode, what did you learn? So um, can I ask you that question? What did you learn? Oh, goodness. It was just such a massive field of, of information. Um, but I have to say, I did see the film Orlando, but I had no idea what it was all about. And I didn't know the background of the author and, and who she was involved with and all that kind of stuff. And I didn't know about Sittinghurst and the gardens. And yeah, there's there's a lot that I'm I'm looking forward to, to having a look on on Googling and Instagramming and, and yeah, learning where all this happened and when and, and, and how I can wear a costume to fit the era. So, yeah, that'll yeah, be fun. Absolutely. I can't wait. Well, we'll have to maybe do series three in period costume. <laughs> Definitely. But what did you learn? Because you know everything, Mock, about these kinds of things, castles uh, and all that. Life is a continual learning journey. That's very kind of you. I, I was most interested in her response to my asking her about, you know, interpreting history and being woke and sharing hidden history and her talking about history it's more history and it's filling in the gaps of history rather than, you know, in any way kind of impacting negatively on the history that's already been told. And actually, when you come from a place of privilege, you can define what history is and you might know all about history, but you have to see yourself in it to really understand it. And that links the whole idea of the National Trust being for everyone forever. So I really, really liked that. So great to talk to her. Obviously, we've got our next episode coming up next week. So if anyone is listening to us now or watching us on YouTube, please subscribe. Please give us a follow. Please write a review. Um, if you follow us, then we will go quietly into your DMs next week and we'll be able to listen to the next episode. But if you have any questions before then, please email us at lovehistorypodcast at gmail.com. And if you want to uh, find us individually, you can find me on Instagram and TikTok at TikTok, TikTok at Mock O'Keefe. That's M O K O K double E double F E. And Louisa, how may people find you and your gorgeous creations? I'm at Louisa Scott Sewing on either Facebook or Instagram. Super. Oh, and YouTube. Well, lovely to chat to you, Louisa. Lovely to chat to Hannah. Uh, hopefully oh so good to see you we will see you again next week but for now wherever you are and whoever you love we wish you well and we wish you joy take care bye-bye bye, -bye. bye.